Sadvaitam sabadutam parijana saitam krishna chaitanya devam si radha krishna pran sahagana dalita shivishakan bitam sham guru brahma guru vishnu guru devam heshwara guru shaksha parabrahma tajmai shri guru vedam ha dukame pati meyanda shas karupate shaki bhajana shantu shantu vinamaram dukame pati meyanda shas karupate shaki bhajana shantu shantu vinamaram Vande ham sri guru siyata parakamanam sri guru in vaishnavam sthya sri rupam shakatanam sahagana raganatam bitam samsadevam narayanam namaskritam naram chevana ruktamam devam sarasatim vyasam tato jayodiri nishna pareshu bhadveshu nityam bhagata sevayo bhagati utama shoki bhakti bhavati naishtaki nikama kapadur garitam phanam shukama karamunidav samyatam bhibata bhagatam rasham ahor horashikabhu vibayam krishna Sadhuma Pagate Damagin, Karona Stadi Samasha Paranako, Dino Ditam Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Chaji Gadi Taya Krishna Go Binayan Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Chaji Gadi Taya Krishna Go Binayan Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Go Bhakta Vinam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Rama, Rama Hare Hare Welcome to Motivational Monday. That was all we had last week. Last week, all we had was Motivational Monday because I had a tooth extracted on Monday or Tuesday, Monday, Monday. Yeah, it was kind of hurting on Tuesday. And then uh, <clears throat> we skipped Wednesday too. So we'll be back uh, Try and do these three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. And then because the color festival will be looming next week, I don't think we're going to do these classes uh, next week, nor the week after, because we'll be cleaning up after that. But we'll um, we'll go with Motivational Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, and Wisdom Wednesday this week, while we still have a little bit of a margin, a little bit of breathing room between ourselves and the date of the festival. A lot of concerns about the weather, although it is warming. We've gone from highs in the 30s during the day to highs in the 40s, highs in the 20s during the night to highs in the 30s. So pretty much we're getting to the point where whether it's night or day, we're above freezing. We're barely above freezing at night and we're a good 10 to 15 degrees above freezing during the day. So there's a great thawing that's taken place. So um, it seems as if the temperature will not be too chilly or too cold, but uh, there's a lot of wetness, a lot of precipitation, a lot of moisture, uh, which is still in the air. And so I think our main concern is going to be with vehicles, making sure vendors and performers vehicles, emergency service vehicles don't get stuck in the mud. And we're going to spend a lot of our time brainstorming to see how to set up uh, options in case uh, it's really muddy and boggy on the day of the event. But I don't think it's going to be too cold. Probably a sweatshirt and a jacket and a lot of dancing will keep everybody quite warm and quite comfortable. We're going to start our cooking marathon this afternoon and make a ton of vegetarian chili. And tomorrow, I believe we're going to make the, um, the green beans with curd and baby potatoes in a rich curry sauce made with um, seed, spice with mustard seeds and chili peppers as well as uh, asfetida and then the sauce itself is uh, made with basin flour whisked together with yogurt and brought to a boil to make a nice thick wonderful rich sauce it's called funzi kadi green beans in a curry sauce so it should be good good prashadam uh, not only we have our own Krishna food cart, but there'll be about 10 different food carts uh, assembled. So there'll be a lot of different vegetarian, vegan choices. Good morning, Brent. Brent gave a wonderful talk last night. It was about 
going home, going back to home, back to Godhead. Brent is, uh, leads up the study abroad program at Utah Valley University. And I love the way he um, coupled his theme with his, his work. He, he uh, used the theme that we're, we're like students abroad. We're like students in a foreign country away from home. And he had a list of things that he advises his students to be aware of when they're away from home in a, in a foreign country. Get to know some of the local people, a travel light, don't, uh, don't burden yourself with a lot of suitcases and all, because that's a good way to get into trouble. Learn a bit of the language before you go, learn some of the culture. All those pieces of advice <clears throat> are, are principles, they're practices in Krishna consciousness, spiritual world is a place with its own culture, its own language, its own modes of dress, its own food, its way of dancing, its own favorite songs, its anthems, you might say. So you're not going to go to the spiritual world just because you believe in a place where there are clouds with people wearing togas sitting upon them playing a harp. That's not going to cut it. You have to be familiar with the language, Sanskrit, Devanagari, the language that's spoken in the spiritual world. You have to at least have a passing familiar. You have to have at least an awareness. Otherwise, you get there, what are they saying? What's their language? It's not going to be congenial. The food, Krishna is the coward boy. and He has a fond spot in his heart for all animals, but especially the cow. You're not going to get there by eating meat on this plane and then expect to be promoted to the internal energy, the intimate association of the Lord as a meat eater. That's just never going to happen, no matter how fervently you believe or how fervently you pray or how adamantly you're convinced that you're going to the spiritual world. If you're displeasing the Lord by eating his favorite animal, all I can tell you is that you're, uh, you're going to have a really big shock at the time of leaving this body. You're not going to go to the kingdom of God. You're going to go to another place. Let's just leave it at that. I, I thought it was such a wonderful talk because all the bits of advice that he gives his students when they're going off abroad are the same things to incorporate into your devotional practices. Before we transfer to the spiritual world, we have to be familiar with the language. We have to be comfortable with the dress. We have to be all right with the food. Um, we have to, we have to, we, we have the full opportunity to sing the same songs, to wear the same dress, to eat the same food. Practically speaking, as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, there are no boundaries. In this material world, it's a river or a mountain range, which creates the boundaries between one state and another, or one country or another. But the only boundaries of the spiritual world, wherever these three things are going on, that's the spiritual world. Wherever there's Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, full of six offenses, wherever there's Bhakta, his part and parcel, the Jiva souls. And wherever those Jiva souls are connected with the Lord through Bhakti, that is the spiritual world. It can be anywhere. It can be in the in the actual spiritual world. It could also extend into the material world as long as there's Bhagavan and Bhakta and Bhakti. Everywhere there's Bhagavan. And everywhere there's bhaktas. But the problem is that in many places, the bhaktas are not serving Bhagavan. They're serving themselves, having forgotten devotional service. So wherever the third element is there, the active principle, connecting tissue between bhakta and Bhagavan, wherever there's bhakti, devotional service, that is in fact the spiritual world. So by following the advice, to travel light, to learn the language, to get to know some of the denizens of the spiritual world, associate with spiritually minded people, not be attached to this material world. Um, all that will get you to that specific place and into that specific culture, which is the kingdom of God. <laughs> Good luck with the toga and the cloud and the harp. Uh, I, I think it would behoove people to get a more educated, more mature, more evolved to take advantage of the um, antique and replete information about the kingdom of God, which comes down to us from the ancient Vedic culture of India.
having said that, what we're doing in this series most recently is thinking about what it would take to have a mind like Maharaj Ambrish and all the other pure devotees. How would we purify our minds to the point where, like Ambrish Maharaj, we're unconcerned and unagitated no matter what challenges, what enemies, what, what uh, obstacles appear before us, how we can remain calm even in the midst of crisis as Ambrish did when Nirvasa threw that ravaging fire weapon at him. We talked about the three R's and extensively discussed the first two. First R for peace of mind, tranquility and equanimity is to remember that Krishna is always in control. He's within each and every atom. Nothing happens without Krishna's sanction. And if you keep the right attitude and pass the tests, you will come out of any trials and tribulations with double what you had before. The second R is to review your motives. And we talked extensively, not about just what you do, but why you do it. And we talked about how Krishna hates pretenders. He dislikes hypocrites. He wants you to be transparent. He doesn't demand perfection, but he demands transparency. And the third R today is realign our priorities. Krishna says, Aham sarvasya prabhavo matasavaram iti madhvajan buddha bhava samamritaham. From me, everything comes. Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu. Shiva, Vishnu are 98% God. They're temples to both all over India. They're worshipped as the supreme. When I go to India, I love to visit not only the Krishna temples, but the Vishnu temples, the Shiva temples, and I worship full-heartedly. And yet it's important to point out that from Krishna, you get millions of Vishnus, millions of Shivas. And no matter how many millions of Vishnus and no matter how many millions of Shivas you have, you won't get a single Krishna. Krishna is the one God from whom all the others come. They come in two categories. They come as Vishnu Tapa and they come as Jiva Tapa. There are some expansions of the Supreme Personality of God who are just almost as powerful as he is. 98, 99%. Like I said, Vishnu and Shiva. This is called plenary portions. Plenary because they're empowered to manage things. When many people think of God, they think of God as the one who manages everything. Well, God doesn't manage everything. What's the point of being God if you have to go to the office every day? <laughs> the head of the board of directors doesn't have to clock in at the office every day. He's on the golf course or he's on his yacht on a cruise. So what's the point of being God if you have to manage? So Krishna, Krishna uh, claims, he claims his, um, his exemption as a supreme source of everything from having to manage and having to do things the mechanism by which he gets everything done is he expands himself into Vishnu and Shiva, the maintainer and the destroyer. And Brahma is also a lesser expansion who creates in each and every universe. But why you be God if you have to go to work every day? What's the point of being God? So God exercises his power in such a way that he creates plenary portions. Those are plenary because they can, they're fully empowered, managerial speaking. They don't venture into the sweetness of rasa, the sweetness of devotion, the intimacy that Krishna enjoys with the coward boys and coward girls and in a parental affection with his mothers, Yashoda and Devaki and Nanda. They don't, they don't stake, they don't venture into that area of intimacy and sweetness. In other words, they go to they, they're at the office all the time. They don't go to Krishna's home. They don't go to Goloka Vrindavan. They have their own planets in the spiritual world. So Krishna, that Krishna, who is one God and all powerful, who is so powerful, in fact, that he doesn't have to act as God, but he can create from his own self unlimitedly powerful living entities who can manage millions and millions of universes so that he's free to do what's actually important is to love and to be loved. 
not Krishna. Doesn't have to play second fiddle to anybody. He doesn't have to play a second fiddle to Brahma. He doesn't have to play second fiddle to Shiva. He doesn't have to have any rivals. Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu, they all worship Krishna. So why would you worship Shiva or Brahma or Vishnu over Krishna? They themselves would be embarrassed. Vishnu, who is a servant of Krishna, Shiva is a servant of Krishna, Brahma is a servant of Krishna, would be embarrassed. They would be red-faced if you were to worship any of them as God. But delighted, on the other hand, to see you worshiping their own worshipable Lord. So this is what bhakti means. Bhakti cannot be diluted, watered down, to include any other than that supreme singular source of everything. And Krishna is saying, quite rightfully, and with this, he's offering the full protection of the original personality of Godhead. He's saying, Sarva Dharma Padit Mame Kamsa Hamtam Sarva Moksha Sarva. Give up all other varieties of religion, give up all other types of worship. Thou shalt have none other gods than me, in other words, and surrender unto me. And then the compact is, the deal is, that if you give your might to Krishna, Krishna gives his might to those who are surrendered to him. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want to give up our $5, our little $5. We're attached to our $5. The pauper is proud of his penny. But Krishna is saying, if you give up to me your $5, I'll give you a million dollars back. So intelligent sober person thinks, well, if I get a million dollars, there are so many five dollars contained within that million dollars. I'm not the loser, but I'm the gainer by millions and millions of times over. But still out of soberness and excessive attraction, affection, people want to hold on to their little five dollars and say, no, I'm not going to give up my five dollars to Krishna. I'm going to keep it. It's mine. Okay. And good luck with your Five dollars negotiating all the challenges of life, birth, death, disease, and old age. But Krishna offers you his exclusive protection if you offer Krishna your exclusive devotion. Krishna doesn't want to be just a resident in your heart. He doesn't want you to visit him as he's locked up in church for an hour on Sundays and sing a few hymns and pay some lip service and give a a a, a, a a mite every Christmas or every janmashtami. Krishna doesn't want to be kept at arm's length. He's, he can do you too much good. He loves you too much to be okay with the status quo. In other words, Krishna doesn't want to just be a resident in your heart. He wants to be the president in your heart. So in realigning our priorities and looking at our priorities, there are three A's to see what our priorities are, and to see how we might need to realign them. There are three guidelines, and they all start with A. Look at your activities, look at your ambitions, and look at your anxieties. So look at your activities. First thing is, look at your check stubs to see what's first in your life. See where your money is. They say people's hearts are where their money is. Regardless of who or what you say is first place, there's no better indicator of where your heart is and where your devotion is than where you spend your money. It's pretty obvious. I think you agree with me, right? What you spend most of your money on is where your devotion is going to be. It's where your heart is. So do you write the first check every month to the Lord? Do you write it Hare Krishna? Because <clears throat> if you don't, write the first check to Krishna, it has to be concluded that you're not giving him first place. We live in Mormon-dominated Utah, and every Mormon who's in good standing with the church gives 10% right off the top before taxes or anything is taken out. That's the Lord's. Actually, the Lord's owns everything. A hundred percent of what we earn is given to us by the grace of the Lord, but by his kindness, we get to keep 90 percent. 
It's not that 100% is ours and I'm going to give 10% to the Lord. The higher attitude is that it's 100% the Lord's and I'm going to give 100% to the Lord, but he's going to give me 90% back. If we think in that way, we'll keep the Lord as first place in our heart. And as I said, our heart is where our money is. So the first check of the month should be written to Krishna. Another thing you'll notice is that in Indian culture, people generally don't write checks for round numbers. They don't write checks for $100 or $1,000 or $5,000. They'll do 101, 501, 1,001. 5,001, 10,001. The one is Krishna. One stands for Krishna. Krishna is number one. So not only do they write the first check of the month to Krishna, but they add that one to the 50 or one to the 100 or one to the 500, one to the 1,000 as a visual reminder that Krishna is meant to be first place. Krishna claims first place in your heart. A whole Pashantam Narinam Api Krishna Jagat Guru. Aho is an expression of astonishment. Aho Pashantam Narinam. How astonishing it is looking at these Narinam, Pashanti, looking at these Narinams, these gopis, these simple cowherd maidens. They're not high born, aristocratic, particularly well educated, not wealthy. They're village girls. So what could possibly be astonishing about simple village girls who take the cows out and who churn milk and who sing songs and dress themselves nicely for festivals? What could be a whole? What could arouse astonishment in great saints and sages like Narada Muni and like Uddhava or even in Krishna himself? And the answer is, api krishna jagat kuru they have accepted krishna as their life and soul having done so bandar bijam hi bhavantam mritu gana vinabasham having accepted krishna as their life and soul krishna has satisfied all of their needs they have no anxiety save and accept how can i love krishna better this is the prime necessity of life we were created to be loved and to love. If you have to worry about something, worry about the state of your love for Krishna. Other anxieties will go away if you put this anxiety at the top of your list. If you prioritize, how am I loving Krishna? Then the other anxieties will go away. And generally speaking, in material life, our anxieties focus on Five F's. Think about this. We're in anxiety about our finances, our food, our fitness, passions, and the future, isn't it? If you're worried about your fitness, if you're worried about your food, if you're worried about your finances, if you're in anxiety as to whether you're keeping up with the latest fashions, if you're concerned about your future retirement funds or what's going to happen to the kids, and there's nothing wrong with being concerned about these things, but they shouldn't be our priorities. They shouldn't be our priorities. If they are, if we're more concerned in any of these areas than we are about our relationship with Krishna, means, of course, obviously, that God is not number one in our life, that God is not a priority. We have our priorities misaligned. Would you agree with me that worry, stress, anxiety comes in the greatest point of your devotion, isn't it? Whatever it is that you're most devoted to, that's what you'll worry about. If you're devoted to Krishna, then you'll, you'll be concerned about how to chant nice rounds, about how to offer prasadam, about how to nice you know, supportive relationships with other devotees, about how to Make sure that you read scripture every day, chant quality rounds. These will be your concerns. Now, I don't worry about your finances. 
I don't worry about your kids. I don't worry about your job. Why? Why do I not worry about these? Because I'm not devoted to your kids, your finances, or your job. You are devoted to those. Perhaps that's why you worry. Whatever is the fundamental thrust of our devotion, that's going to be where you're going to find our anxiety. So imagine if there was a fundamental shift in your devotion from those things which are temporary, your family, your job, your fitness, your fashion, your finances, to that which is eternal. If you shifted the main weight of your devotion from that which is temporary and bound to collapse and let you down sooner or later, if you stop leaning on something which is temporary and, and bound to collapse, but you started leaning on that which is eternal and substantial, then the question is, what would happen to your devotion? What would happen to your worry? What would happen to your anxiety? I venture to say it would go away. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari Hari. Prabhupada says perfect civilization depends on God's arrangements. God's already provided everything we need. Nitya, Nityanam, Chaitanam, Chaitanam, Eko Vedatiham. If there are areas where there are insufficient basic materials for food and shelter, that's not that God has not provided abundantly, but it is that we have mismanaged everything due to a lack of God consciousness. Look at even the lower animals. Birds chirp in the morning. They're not worried about finding food. They're not worried about whether they're keeping in a fashion. They're not worried about their fitness, nor are they worried about their future. Why? Because they have the simple intuition that God, their heavenly father, will provide them with all necessities of life. They don't worry. He said, consider the lilies of the field. They give no thought for the morrow, and yet they are arrayed in more glory than Solomon and all of his splendor. Our main problem is not the food problem. It's not the finance problem. It's not the fashion problem. It's not the fitness problem. Our main problem is the forgetfulness problem. We've forgotten God. We've forgotten Krishna. And that's source of all other lacks of all worries and other anxieties. So another consideration as far as our priorities are concerned, another A to go along with anxieties is what is your ambition? What do you want to achieve? What is your ultimate goal in life? What is your definition of success if you go to the temple or church or mosque on sundays um, you call yourself a devotee a god conscious person but your ambition is to do with this material world in this material culture to always be looking for more 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 you're looking for the same things that everybody else is looking for you're dreaming about the same things you're working hard for the same things you're saving for the same things then how are you Krishna conscious? How are you separating yourself from the average mass of people who are not going to transcend birth, death, disease, and old age? So because of their material attachments, they're going to come back at the time of death. Nobody's ever satisfied. Nobody's ever finished. Death is always an interruption for the materialists, for the sense gratifiers. And because they're lingering and hankering even up to the fag end of life for more and more sense gratification that leads those living beings to come back and take another material body the old body is no longer capable of delivering them sense gratification so by nature's arrangement they get a new body so they can have another run at it they get a reset they get a restart but however many restarts you get however many burrs you take in this material world the fact is that unless you have an ambition to serve the Lord, have an ambition above and beyond every other concern and anxiety to please the Lord, 
you're just like on a Ferris wheel coming around and around and always back to the same low position, taking another material body in this material world. That's what the culture does. That's what the materialistic civilization does. It ensures that you remain bound up by the economy, by the fashion, by the standards of health. Uh, uh, it, it gives you stress to conform. And when devotees feel that same stress to conform, one has to ask what has been the use of one's devotional practices. In the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says, Yatayi Kamishmika Kambana Suteshu Dadashu Yanga Sankeka Vibhambina Yayatna Shama Eva Hi Kevalam. Shama Eva Kevalam means a waste of time. Now we know that materialists identify the selves of this body. They're attached to this body. They're attached to the comforts of this body as well as to the plans they have for bringing this body more comfort in the future and consequently they're always absorbed in thoughts of their wives and their children and their wealth the last thing they want is to be inconvenienced by the giving up of this body at the time of death what is this body it's mucus bile phlegm full of stool and urine so it doesn't make sense does a sober person dread the giving up of this bag of bones, phlegm, bile, mucus, and stool of urine? Even if you're a materialist, you're still giving, giving up this old body in favor of a new body. But a person engaged in Krishna consciousness, if that so-called devotee is also afraid of giving up this bag of material elements, then what is the use of his having labored to study the scriptures, donated to support the temple, uh, attended all the various services and listened to the talks, all of which are meant to wean him from material attachments, wean him from anxieties about fitness, about fashion, about finances, about the future. If at the time of death, such a devotee thinks only of his wife and children, if he's only absorbed in thoughts of how they will live and how they will manage after he leaves, then he, he has to be considered totally unprepared to give up his body. He wants to continue to live, to drag on even in that old body in order to serve his family, friends, and so on. I knew one gentleman, he was a good friend of mine while I was a life membership director in Los Angeles. He and his wife would come religiously every day. I'd always see him at the services at Mangalarti. Um, he lived quite out to a right of old age. I think he was late 80s. And uh, the last few years of his life were not fun. He had a lot of, lot of ailments and all. And I remember he called me one time and he, he said, I don't know how my kids and my wife will maintain without me. He said, I can't, I find it impossible to chant Hare Krishna because I'm riddled with anxieties about my wife and my kids. And I'm thinking, he had he has daughters and sons, they're all CPAs. <laughs> they're all making over a hundred thousand dollars a year, the husbands and wives. They vacation all over the world, they go to these club med resorts. Actually, club med would probably be pretty plebeian for them. They go to these, uh, they, they live in you know, Newport Beach. Newport Beach, to get a one-bedroom house costs a million and a half dollars. They live in like an eight-bedroom house in Newport Beach with the kids. So I'm thinking, you're not taking care of them anymore. I know I know that throughout his whole life, of course, he earned and educated them and set them up very nicely. All, all glories, give credit where credit's due. But, but at this stage in his late 80s, he wasn't a factor in their maintenance at all. Just the opposite. Everybody had to pitch in time and resources to take care of him. So he should have been thinking, it'll be good. It'll be good if they get me off their hands. I've, if they will be unburdened by me and I will be unburdened by this old 
material body, which is riddled with all kinds of effects. So common sense would say that at that stage of life, one would want to chant Hare Krishna and be eager about making the transition. And yet, due to a lifetime of, a lifetime of attachment, a lifetime of serving one's family, apparently one cannot graduate beyond that at the time of death. Now, let's take example of those who have practiced devotional service seriously and conscientiously and diligently. Of course, one such example is Kadamba Khan Swami, left his body March 9th, a few days ago. I met him briefly at the Sadhu Sang here last May in Utah. I was instantly attracted by his intelligence, his kindness, uh, his devotion. Yanhara Darshana Mukha Aisha Krishna says that a, a, a true Vaishnava, a true devotee is he upon, you just have to see their face. You just have to exchange a few words with them and immediately you want to be like them. Immediately you recognize that they have something that you want. Kadama Khan Swami had that quality. Uh, no sooner had I met him than I thought he's my new best friend and it Shortly after the sadhu song, he announced to all of his uh, well-wishers and friends and disciples all over the world that before the sadhu song, he'd had a diagnosis that his whole body was riddled with cancer and he was only given a few months to live. And yet he came to the sadhu song, he extended himself, he gave joy, even though he could have had a pity party, been all bummed out. 68, not, not the youngest, not the oldest either, I'm almost eight years older than that. Krishna's given me eight more years to serve than, than, he, than Krishna gave him. Um, and yet he was cheering up other people. He's a support, um, a, a well-wisher and friend to other people. He didn't draw any attention. He didn't even mention, nobody was aware that he was living under a death sentence. And yet he was smiling, leading wonderful kirtans, standing himself, making time for everybody and anybody, including myself. And during his last days in Vrindavan, he chanted a couple of interesting points in this connection. Uh, he wasn't always able to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, audibly, because when one approaches the time of death, the senses go, seeing, speaking, hearing, they grow one after another. But he had his beads in his hand. He was chanting in his mind. One day, his guru, who was with him, Jayadvaita Swami, said it was early afternoon, and he seemed to be a little upset. And he said, only five, only five. So he was upset that he was so physically weak that even his mind, he'd only been able to chant five rounds up to that point in time. But it is said that he chanted 16 rounds faithfully, faithful to the vow he'd made to his sannyas guru and ultimately to Prabhupada up until the time of death. He wasn't speaking the last few days, very much turned internally. And yet those who are, who are sitting at his bedside noticed that quite often he would smile. A smile would creep over his face. Now, this is someone who's approaching death with full knowledge, with full clarity, with excitement, with anticipation, going to give up this cancer riddled body in favor of an eternal spiritual body to go to live with that flute playing lotus eyed raven haired cowherd boy in the eternal spiritual world what's not to like what's not to be excited where is there any loss you give up this carcass and resume your eternal spiritual body of course he was smiling of course he was smiling because he was realized, he walked the talk. He did not do his chanting. He did not take prasad. Did not associate with devotee. In vain, he truly was anxious. How will I be right with Krishna? <clears throat> and he he could have stopped his rounds. He could have used his um, cancer as an excuse to give up on chanting his rounds the last few days at least. There are any number of reasons why he could have done that. No one would have blamed him. Even Krishna would not have blamed him. And yet he, 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 he wasn't complacent. 
he he was anxious but he was anxious about fulfilling his vows to the spiritual master right down to his last breath he didn't assume anything he didn't presume anything he he wanted to go to the spiritual world and he wanted to leave nothing undone to make himself as eligible as possible to do that and having transitioned over into the spiritual world on march 9th i can say for myself and i'm probably speaking for thousands of devotees all over the world that's just one more reason one more really good reason why we should be diligent in the practice of our devotional service subordinate all of our other anxieties to the anxiety is how can i serve my spiritual master how can i please the disciplic session how can i follow in the footsteps of great souls like kadamba khan swami and rejoin him in the eternal spiritual world uh, if you know uh, anyone who has any anxiety other than that is just missing it that's all i can say you're just missing it another uh practically every day you hear about another vaishnava leaving his body i I knew a nice devotee many years ago. I haven't been in touch with him for decades and decades, but his name was Dhritarashtra Prabhu. He was also, I think, living in, I think it was Rindavan. Very nice devotee. I had some passing acquaintance with him. I forget when it was. Maybe it was with the BBT library party in the 80s. I just remember he was a very nice, polite, genteel devotee. Followed his posts on Facebook that he also was designated, diagnosed with stage four cancer there in Vrindavan, I believe it was. So he checked into the devotee hospice, got really good care, didn't take chemotherapy, didn't take radiation, refused all of that, um, was very happy, very happy, relatively pain-free, chanted his rounds, left his body with a smile on his face. So these trailblazers, these bastions, these these, these who go before us, who set the bar, they do all the work. They do all the trailblazing, just like when it's a fresh snowfall and there's three feet of snow on the ground. You go outside and you think, oh my gosh, it's going to take all of my energy and sap all of my energy. I'm going to be completely exhausted by the time I get 100 yards up to the temple. And then you see that somebody has gone before you and made the nice footsteps in the snow. And you can just follow in those footsteps and without any great expenditure of breath or energy, you can arrive at where that person who went before you arrived. Mahajena yena gata sapanta. The essence of religion. Religion boils down to this following in the footsteps of those who've gone before us. They practice devotional service as it was meant to be practiced with attention, with concentration, with devotion. And guess what? They got the result at the Supreme Personality of God had promised them that personality by whose will the sun rises and sets, the seasons change, the planets orbit. That personality who says, that personality who promises my devotee will never perish. Guess what? Those who have given themselves truly and not pretentiously to Krishna and the practice of Krishna consciousness under the direction of the advanced devotees, guess what? They actually pass the test known as death and become immortal. Ante Kalevaram, Ante Narayanam, Kalevaram Ashtevsharam. The test of how you've lived your life, what your priorities are, and what your anxieties have been will come at the time. Of leaving this body. Tajmad, Sarvashu, Karashu, Mamanushmari, Maya Patamanu, Mami Bhashisiya, some say. We all have duties. We all have family. We all, there's nothing wrong with those. We all have a career. But the question is can you engage in all of that with, with the overriding anxiety in doing all of this? Can I increase my love of God? Can you catch the fish without getting wet? Can you raise a family? Can you do a job without becoming attached to those temporary things, but rather use those as a matter of duty, pursue those as a matter of duty, so that you may come detached and not attached. And of course, the test 
of whether you've executed all that properly will come at the time of leaving your body. And we're fortunate we have two recent examples amongst thousands and thousands of examples throughout history. We have two examples fresh in our minds of those who followed the process and got the result. Kadama Khan Swami and Vidrashtra Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Ah, oh, thank you for being with us. Let me uh, look at, see who we have here on Facebook. As I mentioned, we probably won't be having these classes next week because we'll just be too close to the Festival of Colors. There'll be too many things uh, pressing against our minds, cooking, setting up the festival area, a lot of different things. Oh, here we have Daniel. I was wondering, Daniel, who's... Uh, Coming with uh, Nora, there the two of them make Samadhi Vibration, which is one of the performing acts on stage. They're coming from South America and already getting the mood huh? by jumping on the Facebook comment section. Daniel says, Hare Krishna, dear Chiru, here we are aligning our priorities each and every day towards Krishna. Today you'll help us with this inspirational morning Saturday song. Thanks a lot. Let us know when you're gonna arrive in the country from South America, Daniel and Saban. We long to be there. We long, we long to have you here as well. It's the last time Nora and Daniel were here was before COVID. So this will be first time after four years or so. Divya Josie, I see all kinds of thumbs up and hearts going. Excellent, excellent. We'll look forward to seeing you and Nora after about four years. John Malik, a free spirit is not bound by the materialism. They sing, dance, and flow on the wind. Exactly. Even while supposedly entangled in family, friends, and job devotees, their alliances, their priorities, their affections, their devotion, is for Krishna. They do what they do, not for their own sense gratification, but as a matter of duty towards Krishna. Whatever you're most devoted to, that's what you're worried about. True, Anjali. Jay, good morning. Jay and Kara, I believe. Uh, glad to see your Five F sound like a failing grade. Yeah, one can also say that. Whereas most people's anxieties circle around those five Fs. Those five Fs would indicate you're failing the test of life. Dr. Gary, good morning. Gene, good morning. Leslie. Leslie Bennett, thanks so much for jumping on board. Good morning. Bye, Bobby. Brent. Thank you all. Let's hear from Rob. Bob, give us your post transmission analysis and your takeaways if you're hearing me now. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare All right. So, what I took away from today is it's not a riddle. Krishna does not play second fiddle. <laughs> Surrender to God without a fight, and Krishna blesses you with his might. Mm -hmm. Don't make Krishna a resident. Make him your president. Yes. We're made to love God above. Nice. There's no material anxiety in spiritual piety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Material ambition is a miserable condition. Spiritual ambition is an elevated position. Fine. That's good. I like that. One who serves calms his nerves. <laughs> the devotee footprint has been divinely sent. Wow. Yeah, that's great. What is that? Uh, the lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. That that very well refers to the previous devotees. Well, I, I will post those. I look forward to posting those if you'll be so kind as send me my email. 
that's it. We've got some cooking to do. We've got to start our cooking yoga. Who knows what else is going to come up during the day. Fox News is coming on uh, Friday morning, the day before the festival, to do a whole series of shows on their morning live newscast. So I have to get have a cooking segment, have a music segment, have a yoga teacher segment. I have to send off that out outline to him. Who knows what all else to get ready for this great, great yoga in the state of Utah, which is only, what, 12 days away. But we will be back with you tomorrow and Wednesday. Not so the following week, nor the following week after that. But uh, two more days this week. Thank you. Chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari.